Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reading Genesis with Jesus, week eight. Uh, today, uh, I have Dr. Andrew Steinman with us again, and um, we have uh, we have a passage of scripture that feature, features um, a, uh, a a couple of tense encounters. Right? We have Jacob anticipating and having this tense encounter with his brother, but we also have a very tense encounter uh, with a mysterious figure for, uh, for Jacob. And uh, I'm curious uh, how you answer our three questions. First question has to do with Messiah. Where do you see Messiah in these verses? Well, you have to go to this famous wrestling match, right? <laughs> yes. You just have to go there. And Jacob is wrestling with this man, we're just told, this mysterious man, um, and there are a couple of places here that point us to Jesus as the man he's wrestling with. Mm. So one is, of course, that this man renames him Israel, which sounds like wrestles with God. Mm -hmm. And Israel becomes the name of the nation that expects the Messiah. So right there, we got some Messiah thing going on. Sure. Jacob realizes later on that who he's wrestling with is God. Yeah. And he calls the place Peniel, which means face of God, because he mm -hmm. says, I've seen God face to face. Well, of course, going back to the Gospel of John, John tells us no one has ever seen God. It's the Son who's made him known. Mm -hmm. So if we trust John, and I think we do, we well, then there we go. It's got to be Jesus he's wrestling with. So we actually get to see Jesus before his incarnation dealing with Jacob in this uh, tense wrestling match where Jacob really is getting out all his wrestling, not just with this man, but with his father and his brother, mm -hmm. you know, and his uncle Laban. Yeah. All, all that is kind of being wrestled out here uh, in this kind of climax to his return to um, the land of his birth. Uh, and so uh, this this whole thing of him wrestling with, as he calls him later in the book, the angel of God, Jesus, mm -hmm. um, we see here um, the Messiah kind of moving the story along uh, towards the people of Israel, the people that will produce the Messiah in the flesh. That is fascinating, and I and I, I can totally see where where we make that connection, and uh, I can see also this whole business of of the wrestling and just the struggle that that Jacob's had up to this point. Help me, help us a little bit with the the hip. When he touches the hip. Yeah. He, what is that all about? Well, that shows his power. Um, it, it takes a lot of energy. Physical, you know, talks physics now. Mm -hmm. takes a lot of energy to displace a hip. In fact, in modern times, the most common hip displacements take place in car crashes. Mm. It takes that much energy to displace a hip. So this is a sign of who this person really is, that he is the <laughs> almighty God, yeah. you know, who has kind of... You know, lessened his power so Jacob could wrestle with him, but in the end, gives a hint of who mm -hmm. he really is. Mm -hmm. And we get this interesting thing about, we're told, this is why the Israelites don't eat a certain muscle on the hip yeah. bone of animals. They're remembering God comes to them, mm -hmm. you know, and he comes to them in person. Uh, and as we know, when we read this in the light of the New Testament, he comes to them into the person of Jesus Christ. And so that, that kind of strange custom, what's that custom about? That they don't eat the hip, yeah. you know, the muscle on the hip bone. Well, it's a constant reminder of how God was there with their ancestor. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he's still with them today. Oh, that's just great. That's great. And it is good that they had that reminder. You know, I think sometimes we, we pull away a lot of these things that, that would otherwise remind us of things in Scripture. And, and I, think it's, uh, I think that's a good encouragement for us to, to have those kinds of things that draw us in. Um, I also love how the, uh, the power 
is there at the same time as the humility, you know? And we, we see that in Jesus. I mean, just, here's, here's this guy who's walking around who is able to heal people and raise people from the dead, and he himself raises from the dead, you know? And, and here we get, this, we get this little glimpse, right, for Jacob. That's awesome. All right, give us a glimpse behind the scenes. Uh, what do you see that we wouldn't otherwise see? In this well, place? this is something you can't see if you're reading your Genesis in English. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. One of the, my favorite things to say I ever saw was a Major League Triple Play. Okay. Um, I was at a baseball park in Cincinnati watching the Reds play. I don't know who uh, at the time, and there was a Triple Play, which is... Really rare, right, to see a triple play. Well, we have a triple play here. Hmm. A triple play on words. Okay. And you can't completely see it in English. Um, there are three consonants, which we could kind of represent in English as J, B, and K, mm -hmm. that come up three times in short order. The name Jacob is crossing the Jabbok River and he's wrestling with God. And the Hebrew word for wrestling has that JBK in it again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the text is kind of saying to the reader who's reading this in Hebrew, pay attention here. Yeah. I've done a triple play on words. There's something monumentally important that's coming up. And, of course, what's coming up is the climax of the wrestling match yeah. again. Uh, so, and Jacob has to cross the Jabbok to get there. I love that because it's, I mean, we have our, our things that we do in our, our language, our culture to, to get people's attention. And I think it's the, it's the shame that we don't all know Hebrew, right? <laughs> that we, that, and it doesn't translate. I, I don't even know how you would even do that, you know, in our language. Our language right. doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, but it's helpful to know, like there's, it's like a pay attention everyone moment that's all integrated into the text. Um, yeah, I really, I really appreciate, I really appreciate that, um, that little, uh, insight yeah. for us. Sorry, I wasn't um, oh. all right. So then let's, uh, let's get to a message for us today what can what can what does this passage have for modern day christians yeah well as jacob kind of enters back into the land of palestine although he's coming down the eastern side of the jordan uh, river not the west but kind of as he leaves syria and he gets into palestine we get what seems to be kind of a, a strange thing to mention and then it just goes away and you're going well what was that about hmm. Jacob comes into the land, and God's angels meet him. Okay. And he calls the place Machanaim, which means two camps, because there's his camp and the camp of angels that are there. Right. Huh. Okay. Well, kind of unexpected. And I think that's the way we are with angels. We don't expect angels around. Sure. And, in fact, this is one of the few mentions of angels active in the lives of the Old Testament saints in the entire Old Testament. And I think oftentimes we take God's angels for granted. You know, Luther teaches us to pray in the morning and evening prayers, let your holy angel be with me, right? Mm -hmm. That the evil foe may have no power over me. But how often do we seriously take that, that God has his angels with us and watching over us? And I'm sure much of the time Jacob was in... Um, Pat and Aram with, with his uncle Laban and all these things are happening to him. He's not thinking, well, I'm going to be all right because I got angels all around me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? I, I'm not sure he even thought about it. God, in this case, revealed it to him that he's coming back into the land and God is kind of sending him a message. You don't have to be afraid. My angels, my messengers are there with you. Right? And he get, actually gets to see it. Well, we don't get to see angels, mm -hmm. right? Or if we do, we don't know we're seeing them, right. maybe. Um, but um, nevertheless, God promises his angels are with us. They're watching over us. And, and I think uh, we need to be bold in saying that, you know, God's angels are there, especially for our spiritual protection. When we are weak in our faith, mm -hmm. when we are 
doubting. The angels are there fighting off the devil. And Luther teaches us, let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. And I think, you know, we all go through these highs and lows in our faith, every one of us. Uh, and I know what that's like because I've been through it too, right? Mm. But God says his angels are with you. You may be at a low point in your faith. You may be having doubts. But buck up. The mm -hmm. angels are there with you. That's They're right. fighting off the devil and his throwing doubts at you. Uh, this was a great comfort to Luther in his day. And it should be a great comfort to us in our day too. Um, when, when we're wrestling, as it were, with our faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we... Our, our secularized society has sort of pulled the, the spiritual out, you know. Um, and, and I think it's easy for that to get into the church where we, we, don't even, we don't even consider celestial beings at work or even, even kind of a, a, a world of, of you know, kind of a spiritual realm, you know, those kinds of things don't even like, they don't even come into our minds. We just, we, we are really very much like in the moment and, and the things that we see. Um, but I think to be, to be honest with the scriptures and the way in which God works with his people is to say that there are angels. They are out there helping. There are, there's a spiritual battle going on and, and God is fighting for us and, and that is a beautiful thing to hear especially when when the struggles are happening yeah. all right well i think dr simon has given us quite a bit to talk about i am confident that god's angels are watching over you as you have your conversation today so long everyone <laughs>